Fern is meeting Welsh historian Aled Eirig at Brecon Barracks. I was quite shocked today finding out that my great-grandfather, Evan, refused to join the army. I know from this document here that he was arrested and then he was brought with another objector here to the That's barracks. Right, yes. So what <clears throat> sort of thing would happen once you arrived at the barracks? They tried to persuade him to put on an uniform, to conform to regulations, which he refused. And if you look down the list, his name is is there. Yeah, Meredith. Yeah. Does that say six? Six months. Six months? That's a long time. So he would have um, uh, been sentenced on this day, and then the following day, he would have been taken to a civil prison. Where would he have gone? Well, we have this document here, if you have a look. This is August 1918. Yeah. The following yeah. cases were decided at Wormwood. Wormwood Scrubs Prison? Yes, yes. In London? That's right. So that's where he goes next. And uh, That's quite a long way to go from South Wales. He does get a lift. Goodness me! But if you go down the list, you can see his name there. OK. So 5298 Evan Moretti. Yeah. So the interesting thing about this is they give him a Category B. Category A was where they thought the person was posed the war on, on religious basis. OK. B suggests that Evan was seen as somebody who posed the war on political grounds, which they didn't like, in that people argued that it was a capitalist war between imperialist powers, that it had nothing to do with the working classes. Men like Evan didn't accept why they should be fighting. They didn't see ordinary German soldiers as their enemy. They saw the war as reinforcing the inequalities they believed society should be getting rid of. I'm guessing now from what you've said, he had such strong political beliefs that, you know, it was worth doing six months' time rather than going against his wishes. Well, gosh. But still, I'm sure the majority of people in Abertillery would have been very, very upset mm. by the fact that he wasn't going to go to war, especially in a period when, you know, families had lost their own loved yeah. ones. It's difficult to imagine how It is. It, what how awful decision to have to make Absolutely. as well. It's, so he was in Wormwood Scrubs for six months, and then That's after right. that allotted time, would <clears> he have been sent back to South Wales? He would have been um, released from Wormwood Scrubs in December 1918, the end of the six months. But then once he walked out of prison, there would be uh, soldiers there from the Welsh Regiment to re-arrest him, take him back to Wales for another court-martial. Oh, my goodness. It was like a catch-22. You couldn't get out of it. If you have a look here... So, the 9th of May, 1919. So, by now, the First World War is done. It's over. Absolutely. But he's still got to serve his time. So, men still in the hands of the military and civil authorities. There we are. Meredith, Abertillery, and then it says Carmarthen. What, where, what's that about, then? Well, Carmarthen, in West Wales... Yeah. Um, ..is a... or was a garrison town. It had its own local prison. Wow. I mean, it kind of makes no sense, cos you want him, really, to get back to work and keep that mining community alive and put him to good use, but they were m more adamant on just keeping him in there for the punishment. That was a very controversial issue uh, at the time, and there were lots of protests um, from public figures about the treatment given to conscientious objectors. But Evan ended up right in the middle of that row. Yeah. Gosh. I didn't know anyone from my family had ever been in prison. <laughs> what <a> revelation! <laughs> I feel slightly confused and, I guess, in conflict about the information I just learned. On one hand, I massively admire Evan's courage and his strong-willed ways and the fact that he vehemently stuck to his moral reasons as to why he didn't want to go to war. Even though he had these severe consequences, he still stuck by that, and I really admire that. But then, on the other hand, there's so many families that obviously lost relatives at war in the same area, and that's unbelievably heartbreaking. So it's really hard to sort of 
digest it all and work out how I feel. Fern has come to Carmarthen to find out Evan's fate following his second court-martial. She's meeting historian Professor Lois Bibbings. Thank you, Lois. What I know is that my great-grandfather, Evan, was brought here to Carmarthen to serve a second sentence of being an objector. Do you know how long he would have been here? Well, this is one of the original papers from um, Carmarthen Prison. OK, so Evan Meredith, 14th of December, 1918. What's that date? That looks to? like the date on which he was court-martialed and sentenced. And then, so this here says disobeying a lawful command. Yes. So what would that have been? So, yeah, something like not putting on a uniform, most probably. Something fairly mundane. One year sentence. Yes, so his six months has now become second sentence, one year and hard labour. Oh, my goodness. The prison regime at that time, as you might imagine, was, was fairly strict. There would be a single plank for him to sleep on. For the first two weeks of his sentence, he'd be lying on the plank with no mattress. After two weeks, he would have earned the right to a mattress. Um, he'd have a stool, um, a small table, and a few pots for drinking and doing other things. Got you. <laughs> Got you, Lois. Mm -hmm. um, and he would be adhering to the silence rule. So he wasn't allowed to communicate oh with other goodness. prisoners. He wasn't allowed to speak. And that's what objectors found really the most hard. So isolating. It's horrible. But prisoners, if they behaved well, were automatically entitled to a one-sixth remission of sentence, so two months off, effectively. Oh, right. Do you know if Evan did behave well and he got out early? Well, if you have a look at the next column... So it says remarks, and Evan's got quite a lengthy section in, in there. I guess the really important date to look at is the temporary discharge and to wonder why he was discharged at that point, because it doesn't matter either the end of his sentence or the, the usual remission period. Yeah, it's quite a way before both. So do you know why? Well, we do have a little bit more information in Evan's case. We're very lucky to have located a history of the Meredith family. And chapter three of that history is written by Evan, and it records what happened to him in prison in the First World War. Wow. We had heard of hunger strikes in various parts of the country and some of them were beginning to think in these terms. Not only that, I was in the best position to organise such a move. So I'm trying to get my head around this. So he was basically the person who started a hunger strike here for a group of prisoners. Am I right? Pretty much. There have been hunger strikes in some of the prisons around the country from 1918 onwards, and they were largely about conditions in which the prisoners were being held. By this time, post the armistice, they tended to be about release dates. By careful contact, I discovered that everyone was ready and waiting for me to fix the day. This I did on a day one week ahead so that I would be sure of contacting each man individually beforehand. The appointed day arrived and every breakfast was returned to the kitchen. Wow. Including my own. On the fourth day, the governor called in the evening to bring the news that I was to be released the next morning under the Cat and Mouse Act. The Cat and Mouse Act had been introduced in 1913. Officially known as the Prisoner's Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act, the government had passed it to tackle the hunger strike protests by suffragettes held in prison. Instead of force feeding them, the act allowed the early release of weakened prisoners who might be at risk of dying and their re-arrest once they'd recovered. So when conscientious objectors like Evan began their hunger strikes in 1918, they were treated the same way. Do you know if he was then re-arrested after that temporary time of discharge? We don't for sure, but we don't have any evidence that he was picked up again. I'll happily read through all of this. Thank you so much. I mean, what's clear to me already is... ..which I didn't factually know, is that he didn't want to go to war because he didn't want to kill anyone. It's that simple, really. I'm really getting a picture of who he was. You know, it's not necessarily jobs 
location that you continue in that lineage. It's all of those traits and all of those beliefs and they filter through in their own way. So it's really, really special to read his words.